So thanks very much, uh, Dr. Cameron. We have a bit of an audio problem tonight. We have only one mic here, so we're going to have to pass it along. But I want to thank everybody for coming out, especially on such a beautiful evening, um, to really listen to two very prominent representatives, not merely of their own religious communities, the Jewish faith and the Roman Catholic, but really two luminaries, as, 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 as Jeff said, of the Canadian intellectual life, and because they're such deep thinkers, two people of real action. These are not people that just think and write, but these are two people that have been very much involved in different ways, in organizations and so forth. And I think we're really, it's a real bounty to listen to them. I want to add a couple of notes uh, about the introduction. Um, Mary Jo Letty, many people here know her, but I have a special relationship with her. That is to say, I come from Saskatoon where she comes from. And on leaving the house this morning, my wife, who was a high school basketball star if for, for Mount Royal Collegiate, she said, you've got to tell them that Mary Jo Letty was the captain of her basketball team in Zion Collegiate that won the provincial championship. She was a real super basketball player. And I, I asked Mary Jo if I had permission to say that, and she said, no, that's okay. Because people don't know that about her. She was, and then the second thing I found out is she was advi uh, her advisor for a PhD was Emil Fackenheim, who when I came in uh, fall of 69 to study graduate philosophy, I, I took one class from him, and he was the most wonderful professor. And Dr. Letty had the, had the bounty of really working with him throughout her PhD studies. Um, my, my relationship, or my sort of the, 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 that I'm such a big fan of Dr. Novak has to do with the fact that about 12 years ago I introduced him at the Kuchiching conference, oh, yeah. if you remember that. And then I've had a chance to listen to him two or three times, and every time I listen to Dr. Novak, I learn something. His, his work on, on covenant and Jewish law is, is, is outstanding. And, and the other thing that about him is he is one of those people in Canada who's actually given the Gifford Lectures at the University of Aberdeen. Now, the Gifford Lectures, is, is, that's not a small deal at all. William James, John Dewey, Hannah Arendt, Iris Murdoch, there, you don't get invited to do the Gifford Lectures unless you really are someone of note in terms of your scholarship and your, and your influence. And I want to say that the manuscript of, of Dr. Novak's uh, lectures in, in, at the University of Aberdeen are going to be published by the University of Toronto Press this fall with the title Athens and Jerusalem, God, Humans, and Nature. So you should, should all take that a note about that because I'm sure it'll be a very, very interesting book. Now tonight, they're going to launch, and we couldn't have two better people, to launch this conference on identity and common ground. Not just identity and common ground, but identity and common ground in an age of transition. I mean, the, some of the issues out there uh, right now in terms of this rapid transition we're going through are very worrisome. A lot of negative forces at work, but there are also a lot of positive forces at work. There's a lot of convergence in terms of, 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 of issues out there. And so I think the theme that, we've, that the committee that organized this conference have adopted tonight in particular is unity in diversity. Now, unity in diversity. I saw a company logo last week, and I won't mention the company, but their logo was unity in diversity. So in many ways, it's almost become a platitude but one has to ask, is unity and diversity something more than a platitude? Is unity just uniformity? Or when we talk about unity and diversity, do we often make too much of a big deal about our differences and not about the common uh, humanity that we all share? So I think this issue of unity and diversity is one that, that we can come at with in many different directions. And I think I have a number of questions that I'm going to ask once they, they do their preliminary comments. And then after I ask a few questions, we'll open it up to you folks. Um, and now when, when we do this, we're going to, as I say, have a bit of uh, time lag with the microphone because we're going to have to be passing it back and forth as we do this kind of uh, conversation. But I really do think we, we, we're, we're in for something special tonight. And I think over the next two days, and as I said uh, to some of the members of the committee, we couldn't have asked for two better people than, than Professor Novak and Dr. Letty. Now, and I think, Professor Novak, you are going to, we're going to ask you to start it off, 
to talk for 10 or 12 or 15 minutes. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a very important uh, topic that uh, we're dealing with. Thank you for the most gracious uh, introduction. Uh, the title uh, uh, this evening is uh, Unity and Diversity, and I think that um, we have to look at unity and diversity as two poles uh, of which there is an interrelation or a, we might say a dialectic between the two. In other words, you don't have all unity and no diversity, uh, nor do you want all diversity and no unity. Um, but there is a kind of field uh, between them, sometimes moving towards one pole, sometimes moving towards uh, uh, another pole. Of course, unity is something that uh, we all especially uh, seem to want at the present time. I mean, uh, what's going on in the world in terms of violence against uh, 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 religious communities. Uh, I don't think that there's anybody in this room who is not a part of a religious community where there hasn't been some recent violence uh, uh, against that. So we have that uh, a point in common. But if, there were, if, we're, if we were only interested in unity, if unity were uh, all-encompassing, uh, then uh, there would be no reason for any of us to maintain our, our separate religious and cultural identities. Uh, and what often happens when people simply promote unity, let's, let's overcome all of our differences and become united, uh, in sort of kind of a syncretism, it's presented as that, what really happens is, is that the most powerful uh, party to this talk says that basically, of course we can have unity. Everybody should become like me, uh, and therefore like my group, and we will have unity. Uh, and this is, I mean, this, this was the philosophy of the Roman Empire, for example. We'll have unity, everybody will basically submit to us, and then there'll be uh, no diversity. So that is the uh, danger of making un unity the sole uh, purpose for uh, our coming together. On the other hand, diversity, if we only have diversity, uh, then we have nothing in common. Uh, we're all simply kind of uh, monads, you know, uh, floating around uh, the universe, inter intersecting with one another and bouncing off of one another. Uh, but there is nothing in, in common. And yet, uh, all of our traditions teach that uh, human beings are created in the image of God, have a special sanctity, and have a special commonality. And no one uh, uh, religious tradition or religious community can say that we are the image of God and the rest of these people are somehow uh, lesser human beings. So in terms of that diversity is that we have to understand what it is that we have in common without an attempt to give up what makes us uh, different. Because if, if, we, if we don't have any kind of diversity, uh, then there's really no reason for any of us to continue uh, in the traditions that we've not only grown up in, uh, but most of us uh, had options of opting out of these traditions. Maybe some of us have opted into other traditions, but you opted into another tradition, not simply a, uh, a, a universalism. So I think that in the, the task uh, here is to discover what it is that we have in common, what it is that we want to promote in common, uh, without regarding this as uh, the coming of the kingdom of God, which is going to at least in the Jewish tradition, is going to finally unite all of us towards a, uh, an end that none of us have experienced or can even imagine. Uh, and that is, is always the way it has. It has to be a, a dialectic. There's a one pole and another pole. Uh, but certainly, uh, the, the fact is, is that, that unity uh, is something that we both presuppose. It's something that is in our background. Uh, we are all uh, parts of, of, of humankind. Uh, on the other hand, unity is also the, the, the eschaton, the, the, the final goal. 
uh, which, at least in the Jewish tradition, is not something that is brought about simply by human beings uniting, but by you know, God finally you know, calling the end of, uh, uh, of history. So in that, with that understanding, I think that this gives us a framework uh, of discovering what we have in common without anybody suggesting that we should uh, give up our uh, special and unique identities and traditions that many of us have been born into, but which I would venture to say that everybody here, even if you were born into a tradition, it's something that you have reaffirmed uh, as, uh, as your way in, in, in the world. Uh, so at, at that note, I think that this just kind of sets the, 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 the framework uh, so that we don't expect either too much or too little from deliberations such as this. Thank you. Dr. Levy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation to be here and always an honor to be with David Novak. Um, what you are attempting to do in this conference is important. It's important for everybody here, and it's important for many people who aren't in this room. I'm thinking of refugees from all over the world who desperately need us to think about this question, and not just think about it, but do about it something different. Um, I take this unity and diversity question to be key. Uh, not, it's not just a theological question or philosophical, it's political. It's serious. It's not an abstract question. It's the kind of thing that many of us work out in our day-to-day -day lives. And that's where I'd like to situate my remarks uh, tonight. And also just to note, and this is not a prepaid political announcement, but I've developed this further in my recently released book, Why Are We Here? A Meditation on Canada. So let me begin uh, with a brief description of the street where I live. A dinky little street in the West End called Wanda. Wanda Road, as in a fish called Wanda. <laughs> it's, it's an odd little street. And 30 years ago, uh, the core of what would then become Romero House uh, purchased a house on that street and began what would later become known as Romero House, which was a welcome center for refugees who could live in this house for their first year in Canada. And it was to be open for people from any religion, faith, culture, or country. We moved in. At that time, most of the people in our houses were from the Horn of Africa. They were visible. And in my mind, they were beautifully visible. The ladies were dressed exquisitely. And as they would walk down Wanda Road, I always thought they were like this vision of beauty arriving on our dinky little street. Um, we were engrossed in the process of building a community in that house. And we soon had three other houses within the same neighborhood. But we did not notice the neighbors. We noticed the people in our house, but we didn't notice the other people on the street. But they noticed us. And when we made an application at City Hall to renovate the coach house garage in the back, so that we could store furniture there. The whole neighborhood, hundreds of people, rose up, went to City Hall, went to the Committee of Adjustment, and objected. 
And the reason they objected was that if they renovated, they were going to build a 10-story building. There would be prostitution, drugs, and peeping toms everywhere. So this no-name neighborhood in the West End that until then had no identity defined itself by what they were against. They had come together to object to the renovation of this garage and the message clearly was not in our backyard. We don't want you here. So it was a unity, a neighborhood became unified by who and what it was against. And it was a devastating experience, as you can imagine. We, I really felt, and I said this to our board members, I don't think we're going to make it here. There's too much hatred. There's too much fear. We cannot welcome people to this country when people on the same street are thinking these thoughts. But slowly, and I can't go into all the details about how this happened, but a thousand acts of small kindnesses happened. And over a period of five years, and small conversations, small gatherings, saying hello on the street, that animosity began to evaporate. And to the point now where 30 years later, every year that little street has a party. And it is now considered, some tell me, the highlight of the social life of the city at that time. Like, we're on the social calendar of people. <laughs> and it happened slowly and gradually. It was nothing we could manipulate or manufacture. But it began to happen. And I remember in the middle, in the time of great turmoil, sitting on the front porch of that little street and looking out at these neighbors who rejected difference and diversity. And I thought to myself, I cannot imagine what we hold in common. We don't share a common religion, we don't share a common language, not common culture, not a common history. People have arrived at different times. Our economic realities are very different house to house. Our interests are different. We are different personalities. I mean, it was there was nothing in common. Everything was so diverse, it was just unusual. And then this insight came to me. We hold nothing in common but what we hold right in front of us in common is the street. The street, the space in between us. And I thought to myself, in each house on the street, there is a family or people or a collection of people. And that is private property. That is where people live in their differences, which for them is normal. But the street is different. It's not private property, but neither is it simply a political piece of earth. And I felt then, and I feel even more so now, that if I could understand how the street 
functions as an in-between space, in between all these differences, we in fact hold a street in common. And that street functions to the extent that we begin to understand it's the good that we share in common. And I think that the common good, coming to a deeper understanding of a common good, is what will lead us forward on this very profound question of unity and diversity. So holding a street as a common good means you try to make it more beautiful. You try to make sure the garbage is put out. You try to make it safe. And here are the teachings of Jane Jacobs about the importance of looking out for each other constitutes a common good. So I see the street as a kind of paradigm for the in-between that is so essential in forging some sense of unity in the midst of diversity. And I'll just go back a little bit in history just to beef this up a bit. I realize that the notion of the common good is an ancient concept, but it's also a very ancient reality. If you think of the villages in the medieval period, the small villages, every one of those villages had what was called the commons. And the commons was the place that nobody owned, but everybody used or could use, that nobody owned, but everybody was responsible for. So it was where there were festivities, marriages, dances, fairs, selling the food. It was the place of the common life. And it began to disintegrate as a foundational experience during the time of the enclosures when people took more and more of that common space uh, for their individual property. So I have found this new, ins this fresh insight into the common good as very exciting, very relevant, and very, very important. And I'm tossing it out at the beginning of this conference to encourage further discussion about this. There is a lot of thought now going on. It's called the commons. If you look on the internet, you'll find all kinds of organizations. And I see this as a fresh way of coming at some understanding of unity. What might that mean? And it has a lot of significance for political realities such as nation states, provinces. What is the good that we hold in common? And I feel that if we could engage that question, uh, we would be on a kind of fresh understanding. Instead of talking about how we're different or the same, but to say we live in a common good. And that's our challenge today. So thank you very much. Now, I have a couple of questions I want to ask, but before I do that, I just thought I'd ask uh, Professor Novak if you have a comment on what Dr. Letty has just said, and then I, I'll ask my question. No, I mean, I, 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 I think that, uh, you know, developing uh, areas uh, where we can come together uh, in, in common uh, 
is, 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 is a very laudable thing. The question is, uh, how do we, is it simply a, a coming together like a block party, or is it something where there's some uh, celebration? Uh, I mean, if one looks at, for example, common celebrations, uh, let's say Canada Day, uh, uh, I'm, I'm told I'm I'm I've been a Canadian citizen now for 20 years, uh, but I'm told that in the old days that there was a real cause for celebration. I mean, people would have uh, come together and uh, there would be you know block parties and whatever, uh, and uh, yet one doesn't uh, see that uh, any longer because. Patriotism is considered by many to be uh, divisive, uh, nationalistic, or, 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 or whatever, and I think that that is, is, is a danger. Of, we should celebrate Canada. Canada is, 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 is a wonderful history, and Canada is a wonderful history. Uh, and I think that that's something that, uh, listening to this, uh, what you were saying uh, uh, is, I, I, I think, a, a, a place to uh, begin, and this does not mean that we reject people from other uh, nations or other uh, societies or, or, or whatever, but I think that there is a, uh, a pride that we should take, and it's something that I think that one could uh, uh, clearly celebrate, and uh, the fact of the celebration, it's the same thing in the United States with the, with the 4th of July. Uh, I remember as, as a child there were, there were real celebrations and whatever. Uh, and now, uh, holidays that are supposed to be, you know, for all of the people in the society, uh, become frequently a day for uh, bargain sales and uh, uh, whatever. So this, the, I, I mean, this is what what came to mind when when, when I was resonating with what you were saying. Hmm. So. I, it is a great party, but I'm not really talking about parties. I'm talking about what are the spaces that none of us own, but we're all responsible for. And I think that a great deal of our political conversation at the present moment is being corrupted by an overuse of rights as a basis for discussion. Who has rights to this, that? and the other thing. I think more interesting is the question, are there social realities that none of us own, but we're all responsible for? For example, um, knowledge, libraries. These are examples of social realities that none of us own completely but we're all responsible for and can contribute to. Water, trees, the environment, that's a perfect example of the good that we share. And that this good begins to disintegrate when we become possessive. That our politics are being driven by, I'm paraphrasing C.B. McPherson here, a kind of possessive nationalism. And we think of nationalism, to go to your comment, David, we think of nationalism as, if we're citizens of a country, it means we own this place. We own it. And we have a right to buy it and sell it and make a profit from it. And we have a right to say who gets in and who gets out. And that is at the root of so much of the anger and divisiveness. Whereas I think if we can begin more with this fundamental sense of what is it that we're responsible for? To be a Canadian means to assume responsibility for this time and this place. Oh, well, I could go on. But. So the question that a number of questions come to mind. One of the first ones is, of course, the neighborhood and the street is is critical, and we have to develop those relationships, small acts of kindness, as you said. And I think the 
the language and the values of religion come to the fore there and, and really work very well. But when we scale it up, and of course immediately what comes to mind is the planet Earth, that blue sphere out there in space that we're all that belongs to all of us as, as, as human beings, as humanity. So the question is, how can we scale up the language and the values of religion from from our small communities that we all that we all belong to? To, to either a national or, or an international level? And is there a place for the language of love to overcome the language of extremism and the ex intense polarization right now that's happening between people? So I just want, want one of you or both of you to comment on that, that issue of how religion can contribute to a language that brings people together, as you say, on, in, on a block or in a neighborhood, but how can it serve to bring together the country in a way without putting off the secular people and the people who, who are so anti-religious now that one, one sees that, uh, that being expressed so, so often. Do you have any comments about that, the scale issue, when we come to the... Uh, well, I'll leave it at that and see if you have any comments. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, I would agree in terms of possessiveness uh, that uh, all possessiveness is, is, is quite relative. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, certainly uh, biblical teaching is, is that we do not possess the world. Uh, we really don't possess anything. We simply, it's been lent to us. Uh, and therefore, we're, we are responsible for it, taking your language of responsibility. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, yes, it, it, it means that uh, uh, if, as, let's say, as Canadians, uh, we're, we're responsible for what happens in this country. We're also be responsible to protect it, uh, to enhance it, uh, to make it a force for good in, in, in the world. Uh, uh, now I know nationalism gets gets a bad rap, and uh, uh, we can use some other uh, phrase. But I but I, I think the the, the notion that uh, uh, there's no such thing as uh, different nations and different countries and uh, what have you, uh, and we sort of kind of melt into some kind of uh, amorphous uh, uh, mass. Is, uh, it, it's, is the type of unity that I think is uh, dangerous because it doesn't recognize uh, legitimate differences. The question is, how do we, how do we live with those differences without, uh, without violence, without uh, uh, selfishness? Uh, yeah, that uh, is the fact. But, but I, I agree with you. In fact, the Hebrew language you know, does, not, does not have a possessive. Uh, if, just, if to say my house means uh, Bayat Shali means the house that has been lent to me. The earth has been lent to me. Uh, so I'm responsible for it. Uh, and my responsibility means that I have certain rights there uh, that other people do not have who are not responsible for it. We also have re responsibility for, 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 for common area. Uh, so, I mean, I... Uh, uh, you know, agree with many of the things that uh, that you're saying, uh, uh, but I don't think that it. Uh, uh, it, you know, it it it, it deals enough uh, with the fact that there are certain things that we do not have in common, uh, and that we ought not to have in common, uh, because it simply melts us into some. Uh, uh, kind of faceless entity, uh, and inevitably, what happens is it's the most powerful particular that you know that, 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 that takes over. So I, so I think that if we, and, and I'm listening to what you're saying. I mean, I, I think that if we take responsibility for small things uh, and do not think that we are somehow are they going to, uh, and, you know, some some grand global uh, type of globalism, uh, I think that is a uh, way to start. Now, you mentioned Jane Jacobs. I'm a great fan of Jane Jacobs because I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm an urban person. I grew up in a big city, and I, one of the reasons, many reasons I came to Toronto was Toronto was a big city. I, 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 I like that, and the things that corrode uh, common life uh, are, are, are things that I think that we should be uh, aware of and attempt to uh, minimize.
now we're getting into the really deep questions. <laughs> um, I think that fundamentally when we start talking about our place in the world, um, we're getting down to the basics. And I do think um, unity, division, the questions that we've just surfaced now, uh, boil down to how we see our place in the world. And there is a very destructive form of social life that sees human beings as masters of the universe. We make it, we break it, it's ours, we own it, it's the worst of Western materialism or global materialism. But what, and I think David is, is introducing this very important concept, what religions have to bring isn't just this or that teaching, it's a fundamentally different way of looking at the place of human beings in the world, and that's what I think you're saying, that we, we're not the owners. We're the ones who receive a gift, and we are responsible, but we are not the center of the world. And I think that that conviction is shared by all religions, as far as I know, that there is this fundamental sense that we are servants of the world and of life. We're not the masters of the universe. And so no matter how corrupted our various faith traditions have become at different points in history, there is this stubborn sense, this hearkening, I don't know what else to call it, that that we are not the center of the world. And that we can share. And that's the enormous gift that religions have to bring. It isn't just this or that teaching, this or that program. It's that we see the place of human beings in a very different way. So I, I like very much this idea of a kind of a humility a genuine humility before God and the, and the Creator and so on. And I, I know Professor Novak mentioned the fact that we're all created by God. This is a, we're all creatures of God. The question then I ask is, and I, I like so much that comment you made about the language of rights getting in the way. Professor Benjamin Barber here has often said that religious people often revert to a kind of a language of rights in claiming their religious freedom rights instead of the language of religion which is a language of humility a language of moderation a language of love and so on the question that i ask is can we in driving towards unity and diversity use our religious faith our religious language and values to reach out to the secular society and to the society that some elements, not all of it. Much of it is humanist and very, very fine, but some of it has become extreme and polarized. Is there a way for religious communities to work, either together or, 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 or within one's own faith community, to make that bridge, to really answer this, what this conference is about, bridging the secular religious divide? So, so I want to ask you about that issue. Well, yeah, well, let's... Let's look right in our own backyard. Um, I mean, when, when one deals that uh, uh, with religions, and there really is not religion, capital R, and then there are little branches of it. There are religions. They have overlapping uh, uh, connections and whatever, but there's not one essence called religion, and then we have you know various uh, species thereof. Uh, but if one looks at the relation of the secular, uh, <clears throat> which is something that uh, I, I, I've dealt with a long time, there, there seem to be uh, two notions at work. There, one is somehow there is a notion that 
Uh, and I heard just recently the head of a, of, of a major Jewish institution of learning say, what we need is a new religion. Uh, maybe the old religions haven't done the job. Uh, well, religions are not created by uh, people. Let's, let's have a new religion. Religions, if you look at all of the basic uh, religions that we're dealing with, they are based upon revelations. Somebody said that God spoke to them and they gathered people uh, around them. Uh, and this is that this is not something that one simply says to invent a religion. No, nobody would follow a religion if somebody said, I invented it, uh, or you invented it, or anybody else invented it. That's one point. The other point is what we have to understand, and I'm going to use an example uh, of what's happening in our neighboring province of Quebec, uh, is that there are those who have said, and they've said this since the Enlightenment in the 18th century, that the problem of all of this uh, uh, divisions and all the violence that comes is because it's religious. Religions divide people. So therefore, let's do an end run around religion and create something called secularism. Sound familiar? Uh, okay. <clears throat> so that this is the factor and our neighboring province the leadership of that province has declared that we are no, we're basically secularism, a laicite uh, in, in French, is now our official ideology. Uh, and therefore, all of these different religions are going to have to justify themselves and seriously ad justify themselves and seriously adjust themselves to our reality. Well, two things uh, happened in, in the face of that. One, uh, several years ago, the Jewish Hospital of Montreal um, took, uh, took out an advertisement because remember the, the rule is that you cannot, cannot wear any religious symbols. You know, no uh, kippah on the head, no hijab, no uh, crucifix around the neck. Okay, and they had a picture of a uh, obviously a Jewish man with a uh, kippah on uh, his head, and. Um, uh, a Muslim woman with hijab, and it was a beautiful notion under that. The Jewish Hospital of Montreal is interested in what's in your head, not on it. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Uh, so that is, and I was just recently read in, 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 in the newspaper that the mayor of Montreal, or Montreal, I should say, uh, overwhelmingly the city council there said that they're going to totally ignore uh, these uh, proscriptions of wearing religious symbols or, uh, uh, or that sort of thing. In other words, they are openly defying a secularism which claims to be a new invented religion, which I think is an oxymoron in invented religion, uh, to replace that. So this is the type of unity that there are those who are opposed to all of our separate religions. Let's, let's face facts. Uh, posing this is this is going to resolve the problem. Uh, well, it's not going to resolve the problem because violent people don't need religions. Uh, as It can be an ideology, it can be a fantasy or whatever to justify uh, violence. And our religious traditions have very good means for dealing with the violent people in our own uh, communities. So I think that this is something that we have to uh, clearly understand, is that yes, there is the realm of the secular. There is a realm where religions cannot simply dictate uh, many things in terms of public policy, but can rather dictating can bring the rich resources of our traditions. Uh, but understanding that there has always been, uh, not only in the West, but even in, in, in Asian countries, a notion that religions are the problem and therefore, if we would basically have something that was not a religion, uh, that's a human invention rather than claiming to be a revelation from God, uh, that somehow or other this would uh, solve the problem. So I think that we have to understand and that, uh, uh, that there's certainly said there's a common enemy. Now, that's not what should bring people together, but it's something that should be recognized. You talk about politics, well, this is politics, and this is something that... Uh, uh, requires our uh, vigilance. Now I'll let Dr. Letty comment too, but in the meantime, start thinking of some questions because we're going to go to questions from you folks now um, after Dr. Letty comments. Uh, 
I mean, this is going to be a wide-ranging conversation. <laughs> um, in one way, this discussion of the secular and religious is really familiar. And it's a conversation I wish we could move forward. Um, and I see this as important for a conference like this. We have to move beyond the kind of frozen thinking and living that has been going on. And I would say to the so-called secularists, look at the world around you. Look at what is happening. We are not on a good path. And a big part of our problem is this master of the universe model that we have all adopted. There is also, and I would take Václav Havel, the former Czech president playwright, as a real guide in this regard. He did not see himself as a religious person, but he said, because we have lost a religious perspective on the world, we have lost the transcendent basis for human rights. That once we lose that, the anchoring of rights in the framework of the, the understanding of the human being as a creation of God, if we lose that, um, all we have left is the assertion of a Western secular culture that human rights matter, and it's not enough to hold it together. So in all of this, to me, the important challenge is we must not define ourselves in terms of who and what we are against. That's what happened in our neighborhood when groups, when nations or religions no longer have a vibrant, vital sense of what they're for, then you will definitely always turn to finding an enemy. It's just inevitable. So we're now ready for your questions. Just, I just want to make a plug for a talk tomorrow. We have Professor Solange Lefebvre here from the Université de Montréal, and I'm sure she'll be addressing this issue that Professor Novak raised, the whole question of laïcité au Québec okay, and the situation there. One of the saddest things that I noticed on a poll recently done by Angus Reid was the fact that they asked people questions of which province do you like the most or something like that. And, and I was so heartbroken because so many people in the, in the Anglophone provinces of this country, Quebec came, came at the bottom of the list. And I happen to love Quebec. I've lived there for eight, eight years. I just love Quebec. And I think when you were talking about block parties, their Saint Jean Baptiste Day is something I always remember very, very well in Quebec, where the people really did come together. But of course, then there are issues around that. So I'm, 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 I'm telling you tomorrow, I think at four o'clock, uh, uh, Professor Lefebvre is going to address some of these issues, and I'm sure you'll be interested in that. But do we have some questions now for, for Professor Novak and Dr. Leddy? Uh, please don't hesitate. There's a mic over there, right? That, does it work? Is it ready to go? It just, it, no, yes, no. great. So just raise your hand and go to the mic if you do have a question. Um, Yes. Do, can the mic be... Oh, well, just you'll have to walk around. I, I actually, I got carried away. I saw the committee down here gesturing to me. I got carried away with my own question. So I, unfortunately, I've left you, what, 20 minutes maybe? or 15, 10 or 15. But go ahead with your question. Sure. Um, I'm Eric Jarvis. I come from Montreal. I work at the Jewish General Hospital. I'm a psychiatrist. And I'm very interested in your comments on this issue 
uh, all the issues you've raised. Uh, my question is about laïcité, and it's about if the process of laïcité working itself out in Quebec now, in terms of unity versus diversity, do you think laïcité is working toward universi um, uh, unity or toward trying to protect diversity? Did I, uh, say that question again, just so that we're clear. Uh, laïcité in Quebec, as you mentioned, is a form of secularism. And it's a very, uh, it's rooted, as you know, in French history and politics. And the province of Quebec is trying to resolve problems of diversity through Im implementing this idea in, its, uh, in, in the province. I'm just wondering, you were talking about uh, unity and diversity and how they, how they play together in our society. And I wondered if you could comment on whether you think laïcité in the Quebec context is working towards a unified society or if it's rather uh, trying to preserve a place for diversity by protecting people from religious extremism. Well, there are all forms of extremism uh, and religious extremism is only one. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the notion of laïcité is, is an awful notion, uh, because basically there, there, there's a difference between a re, the, re, respecting the realm of the secular. It's very important. There are areas where clearly religious traditions cannot claim to have public authority. Uh, and uh, certainly in, in, in my tradition, I know in the Christian tradition, I know in the Islamic tradition. In fact, uh, uh, a colleague of mine here at the University of Toronto, Professor Anvar Iman, who's now head of the Islamic Center, and a Catholic theologian by the name of Matthew Levering, and I wrote a book called Natural Law, a Jewish, Christian, and Islamic uh, a Trialogue, uh, dealing with the fact that there are areas of law and morality that religions clearly accept, but they don't accept it, uh, they don't promote it as, as based on their own authority. Uh, but this notion uh, that somehow or other religions are the problem uh, and that we can do an end run around them uh, by promoting an ideology uh, is something that I think is, uh, is divisive, uh, uh, dangerous for democracy, and I applaud the mayor and the, citizen and the city council of Montreal uh, for refusing to comply with it. It's a difficult question. I just returned from Quebec City tonight, and uh, the more you know, the less you know, in some ways. Um, let me just share a slightly different perspective because I, I just don't feel sure enough to talk about the Quebec situation. Um, at the University of Toronto about a month ago, there was a flyer that went up inviting professors and graduate students to a free-flowing discussion on post-secular literature. And it was like a really exciting exchange. I felt we were at a kind of a new moment, a new imagination, which isn't secular, isn't old religion type thinking or literature, but something different. And I'm not just advocating difference for the sake of difference, but I do feel maybe not in Quebec, but I, I feel we are in a new moment of respect and openness for the ancient truths of religion. And I, I guess I want to say, and I encourage you to have confidence in that. I think that people are looking for something to hope in, a reason to hope, and a deep reason uh, to live and to be human, and to find and reclaim the human in the world today. Uh, 
do we have another question? Oh, there's, there's one. Yeah, interestingly, I was, I, I was just at Indigo before I came here because I had a bit of time to kill, as they say. Um, and I was looking at the religion section, and it, I think it's pretty clear that the folks at Chapters Indigo just don't know what to do with religion because they, there's a section on Christianity and then the rest. And, and it, it's so jumbled and so incoherent that I, I couldn't make out what on earth the basis of organizing the books was. But anyway, if there is increased interest in our great wisdom traditions, then perhaps uh, Indigo will uh, figure out how to better organize her books. But that wasn't my question. My question was for Mary Jo Letty. And I was, I was wondering, I, I know you were hesitant to uh, take up too much time to explain how the street uh, managed to become a place of gathering and unity, as it were. Um, and yet, I think those details can be so terribly instructive. And so I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just saying a little bit more, because it's not just about the physical space of the street. It's about the social space that was created by a number of intentional actions. It's a really good question because I'm not even sure after all these years that I know the answer. It's not like I have a recipe. And I think that's probably a good place to begin that, you know, we don't really have recipes for some of the most important things. Um, I, a thousand acts of kindness, for example, when it snows, a young woman from Mexico on her own went over to shovel the sidewalk of a really cranky elderly man from Eastern Europe. And he was like really anti-refugee. So she was shoveling his walk. He came out and said, well, how much do you want for that? And she said, nothing actually in my culture. We always do this for old people. So that was kind of the end of, he was toast. <laughs> um, but little things like that, or small gatherings, or uh, one day we were having tea on the porch and we invited a neighbor to come. One of the neighbors who'd been very negative and she went home and said to her, they were from the Azores, and they had just moved in and they had been told, look, if they build up their garage, our property values will go down. And she went home after this tea and said, Tony, they are really nice people, and more importantly, they love parties. <laughs> and that was a big sell. But so never discount these little things. And what I learned, I've studied community change and development at different times. And the illusion that these books on community change leave you with is, you know, if you have a program, you plan, you go into a neighborhood, and within one year, you will have a neighborhood. That's not true. I think it takes like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And once you realize that, everything begins to change because you're not trying to change people and make them better, but you're trying to be a good neighbor, which takes a long time. Uh, the only final thing I would say in terms of our larger topic, I have lived with people from all kinds of religions, and I mean live on the same floor and sharing the same kitchen. And in my experience, the more I lived, for example, with Muslims, the better Christian I became. And the more they lived with me, they say, the better Muslims. We each became 
clearer, truer, and more ourselves by living with people who were really different. And somehow from 20,000 feet, it always looks like if you live with really different people, you might change and you might become different or there will be problems. But in my experience, the more you live with a person who is different in many ways, the more defined you become yourself. And it's a wonderful experience. It really is. Um, Now, this brings us right back to the lead-off comments of, of Professor Novak about these two poles of unity and diversity, that if it's all unity and uniformity, and uh, that's not the way, and, but if it's all just difference, and uh, that's not the way. And I think those comments, I think, are very a good note to, 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 to close this on because I think there's a reception waiting for us, right? So we're going to have to end there. And excuse me for having ask a bit too many questions, but I really, I, I love these two so much and enjoy listening to them. Uh, I have in the past and I did again tonight. So could you please thank them for, for coming out this evening. <laughs>